but we are concluding our series on changing soil and, and taking a look at what it means for us to really look at what it is that God has called each and every one of us to do. And, and a part of that is to remember that God has called each and every one of us to sow. And what I mean by that is that God, God has filled us and gifted us the gift of the Holy Spirit and then we are then encouraged to sow those seeds so that others may experience the love and grace of Jesus Christ in and through us. Second thing that we talked about is that we must stay connected. I was laughing during our Sunday school time together, the, the group that's meeting before, and we'll have more small groups that will start on September the 8th. But the whole part that one of the things that Carolyn Moore, who was the video that we were watching, she was sharing the importance of small groups and, and how we grow in our faith when we are connected to other people. I, I believe that we can grow in faith by ourselves because that's what God and the Holy Spirit does. But I believe that when we stay connected with others and we allow their wisdom to feed into our lives, we have the opportunity to grow even more. And today we're talking about how it is important to stay engaged and to engage with the world around us. I'm a bit of a sci-fi nerd, and uh, while I can't really say which I like better, Star Wars or Star Trek, I do like Jean-Luc Picard from The Next Generation. And there was always something that he would say as they would go out into the beyond that he would point his finger and he would tell his number two to there you go I heard it he told them that they needed to engage not just to be a, a spectator you know you can't explore space and just be a spectator you have to engage. And my friends, that is what it's like here on earth too. You can't explore what God has for us as a spectator. We must engage. And part of the ways we engage is by sharing in this prayer of consecration. Would you please join me as we pray these words on the screen? Jesus, I belong to you. I lift up my heart to you. I set my mind on you. I fix my eyes on you. I offer my body to you as a living sacrifice. Jesus, we belong to you. And we're praying in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, as we conclude this service, this, this series today, we pray that it helps us to see how we can engage with the world that you have for us and around us, the different areas in our lives that we can allow your spirit to guide us as we move forward together as the body of Christ. So God, we pray that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength, and my Redeemer. Amen. Our scripture for today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, 
not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God was making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want you to listen to a part of this passage again. I don't want it on the screen. I want you to, to really take in these words. But I want you to really think about as we change our soil, if you will, and as we engage in the world around us, I think it's important that we hear these words from Paul once again. Paul writes, If anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Question for you. Who is God's grace available for? Everyone. God's grace is available to everyone. But unfortunately, sometimes we live our lives where we want all of the grace for ourselves, but we want to kind of keep others who we don't feel like deserve God's grace at arm's length. I remember once when I was doing a youth ministry and was a part of a very difficult time of ministry for, for me. Um, I had a couple of parents that were really causing me a lot of problems. I know that doesn't happen with Lindsay at all. <laughs> But as I was dealing with these parents, I went in and sat down at my senior pastor's office and I just went off on a litany of everything that they were doing, everything that they were not doing, all of the trouble they were causing me, all the, you know, just the list went on and on and on and on. And I remember I ended this little diatribe of, of things that these families were doing to me. And I said, you know, I just wish that they would extend to me a little bit of grace. <laughs> and my senior pastor sat behind her desk and she did this. And we waited for a moment and she said, Chris, do you think God's grace is available to them? And that made me stop. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it made everything absolutely wonderful and rosy and everything. It didn't, but it made me think of how I was to be in ministry with this family or, or these families. It made me think, you know, God has given me the opportunity to be a part of reconciliation. But we do know it does take two people or two parties to reconcile. But if one party refuses to, to be, to start that area of reconciliation, then there will be no reconciliation at all. See, I learned from that moment, as Paul was saying, it is important that we are called to be a part of reconciliation, and that means that we must engage with those around us. We must take the opportunity to allow the lives that we live to be a sign of reconciliation to the world around us. See, my friends, Jesus calls each and every one of us to be engaged with everyone that we meet. Jesus calls us to not just to be spectators to the world around us, but, but that we must take the opportunity to engage and be in and with ministries to those that we may not even know yet. 
I think back in John chapter 4, Jesus meets up with the woman at the well. And the woman at the well was a Samaritan woman. Now, if you are familiar with church, and if you've been to church for a long time, you've heard stories about the Good Samaritan and the woman at the well and who a Samaritan is. And probably if you were to ask somebody who is a Samaritan, you'd say, well, that was somebody that Jews had absolutely nothing to do with that, do with. But do you really understand why? What is it that made the Samaritans, these people that weren't even supposed to be touched or looked at or to be in ministry with. Way back in 1721 BC, the northern kingdom was taken over by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians did two different things. They, they, they took a bunch of the Jews that were there in the area called Samaria and, and they took them off to Assyria. But then there was another part that stayed there. And the Assyrians brought in foreigners or people who weren't Jewish and they, they intermarried. So, so when, when the Jewish people looked at the Samaritans, even though they did have Jewish blood inside of them, because they intermarried with the Assyrians, they were considered unclean. They were considered to be those other people. But see, something else happened as well. See, not only that happened, but when Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and to rebuild the city, it was the Samaritans who stood in the way of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So that started a centuries of battle and war between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. The, the, the Jewish people who said, this is where the temple needs to be. This is where the holy city is. And the Samaritans who said, no, we don't want that because that's where the sense of power would go. And, and we want the power to ourselves. So that battle and that war kept happening. And, and, and there were was, there was some sayings that the Jewish people would avoid going into Samaria all the way, which would add time to their story. I've been doing some study, and that really wasn't the case. Because we see within this story with Jesus and the woman at the well, the, the disciples went into the town to buy food, which was fine to do commerce and fine to do things like that, but you just didn't hang out with the Samaritans because they were unclean. They were different. They fought what it was that it was that the Jewish people should have with the city built back in Jerusalem. That's what makes this story so important. Jesus was sitting at the well and a woman came in the middle of the day to fulfill her jugs. And, and as she came, Jesus asked for water. And the woman said, well, if you knew who I was, there is absolutely no way that you would ask for water from me. And Jesus told her about herself, about her past, about the many husbands that she has and how the person she even lived with was not her husband. And her eyes were open and she went and she told others about Jesus and they came back. And I can just imagine the view of the disciples as they came back with their food and with the supplies that they had brought from the town. And they see Jesus basically hanging out with a whole bunch of Samaritans talking with them, sharing a story with them, letting them know that he not only was there in their presence, but he was listening to them. It was very important for, for this stage of Jesus' ministry, and I think it's very important for us now as we look forward to what God has for us as Royce City Methodist Church, that we realize that Jesus gives us an example to engage the world around us. Just as Jesus stopped and engaged the woman at the well, Jesus has called for us to engage those around us. So how can we be like Jesus and how can we engage just like he engaged the woman at the well? The very first thing is that we must 
pray. I say, okay, come on, Chris. That's the pastor example, right? That's the pastor way of saying things. You have to pray and do things, right? Well, that's what Jesus tells us in, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, the Great Commission. He says, oh wait, I skipped, I'm sorry. Matthew 9, verses 37 through 38. He says that the harvest, I, I messed up, Steve. You can go ahead and go back to the, thank you. Matthew 9, verses 37 through 38. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers to harvest in the fields. Have you stopped and asked God to engage you as a harvester to go out into the field. We know that Roy City is growing by leaps and bounds. Maybe we, it's growing like we don't want it to grow, but I tell you folks, it's coming and it's happening. And I don't look at it as a negative thing, even as I'm sitting on 66 waiting for a flag to pass by to let me drive down. But I look at it as a positive because it's showing me that God is giving us more land to go harvest. It is showing me that God is giving us the opportunity to share the love and grace of Jesus Christ to people who may not even know him before. I think a lot of you know that at one time I did a new church start in the Wiley Saxe area. And part of that, I read a book called The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson. And, and this book was all about how you pray over the whole area. And, and it, I've been putting this stuff back into practice. And I'm spending a little bit more time in my car now than I had uh, previously. And I've been praying over our community. I've been praying over new possibilities where our church may go. And I keep praying, God, open something up for us so that we can be a witness of your love and grace to Roy City, just as those who started this church was so long ago. And as I started this driving, I remember uh, uh, something that happened to me as I was praying over the community that I was placed to do this new church start. And, and part of the thing that Mark Batterson said was this, you need to circle the community with prayer. So I thought, this will be great. We have an elementary school, kind of like we are now, that that's, has a neighborhood around it. I am going to pray around this neighborhood and I'm going to drive my car seven times in this neighborhood every day and pray over this community. So Monday I went out and I prayed driving seven times around this school and this community. Tuesday, exact same time, I did the exact same thing. Wednesday, exact same time, exact same thing. Thursday, about my fourth time around, a lady comes and meets me out in the middle of the street. <laughs> and I roll down my window and I have a big old smile on my face. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> what in the world are you doing? I'm going, yay, God has given me somebody the opportunity to share about the new church start. So I just went off. Just, hey, we're starting a brand new church. We're going to be worshiping over here at the school. We would love for you to come. And then I saw the look on her face. And it was just this confused, not angry look, just this, oh, you poor little man. You have no idea what you're doing. And then about that time, it clicks. And I said, I probably should not be doing this, right? <laughs> And she looked at me and nodded and said, yeah, you probably ought to stop. Thank you for the prayers, but it's really starting to freak people out. <laughs> That's not how you get people to come to your church. But I think the example is there for us to remember that God calls us to continue to pray for opportunities to pray for open doors, to pray for the way for us to, to, to share and to sow extravagantly into the world around us. 
so that people may see God's love and grace in us. The second thing that we must do is we must go. Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20 says this. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus tells us to do what? Go. Let's try that one more time. Jesus tells us to do what? Engage. Go. Engage. Go. That's here in just a second. You're just almost ahead of me a little bit. But Jesus tells us to go. Could you just imagine? Well, we wouldn't have the story of the woman at the well if Jesus didn't go. If Jesus would have stayed back and done his Jesus stuff in the community that he was comfortable and, 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 and was able, knew where everything was at, we would not have this story. Just think, my friends, what stories Jesus has for us as we continue to go out into the world, knowing that we have been given this mandate to go into the world, teaching, and sharing God's love with others. Baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and allowing the message that God has given us to be a message of reconciliation and grace. To be a message that makes a difference in the lives of those around us. And that helps us so that we must be observant or we must engage. See, Jesus, when he talked with the woman at the well, he could have very easily just sat down at the well and just waited for the disciples to show up. He could have watched the woman walk up, get her water, and then walk away. How many times do we do that? I'm guilty. I'm guilty of, of seeing somebody who said, you know, maybe God wants me to reach out to them and just to let them know that it's okay. Saturday, Trace and I were out at uh, Grapevine Mills Mall and we were walking around and uh, Trace and I, we got separated for a while and I was standing in the food court and there was a uh, poor little lady back behind the uh, Popeye's fried chicken little place. And she was getting ready for the day and she had all of these big giant cups and as she was getting them ready to display for the customers, a big old giant stack just fell over and landed and made a big noise in the food court and I could see that she was just deflated because they don't have an easy way to get out to the food court from the little restaurant areas. So I walked up to her and I said, hey, would you mind if I helped you? pick up your cups. And I just see the look on her face. Yes, thank you so much. And so I just picked up the cups and I set them back on the table. I said, God bless you. And I walked away. Now, was that a seed? Yes, it was. Did, did I give her the five points of what it means to become a Christian? No. <laughs> Because that wasn't my call at that moment. My call at that moment was to let her know that I was there to help. And I blessed her as I went on my way. A friend of mine on Facebook posted this picture on Facebook this weekend. She posted, make a habit of reaching out to people just because they crossed your mind. How many times have we done that? We've had somebody cross our mind and we said, oh, I'll, I'll take care of that later. Or I'll, I'll do that later. Or, or we'll see something that will happen and we'll go, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I reach out to them, make sure that they're okay. I think that is one of the ways that we can stay engaged with the people around us is to be observant and reach out to them and say, hey, I see you. I hear you. I know that you may have a struggle in your life, and I want you to know that I am there for you. 
when we do that, we do everything for God's glory and God's good. Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says it this way. So whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Now, I know Paul is writing this about food laws and how we shouldn't eat food sacrificed to idols. But, you know, this is kind of a good thing for us to do in all of our lives. Whatever we do, whether we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we think, whatever we, we speak, whatever we drive, whatever we write, whatever we call, all these type of things, we must do this by the glory of God to allow him to continue to work in us and to sow in us so that we may sow into the lives of others. So several years ago, whenever I uh, became your pastor, I really started to get connected with uh, Seedbed, which is a uh, publishing house. And part of that publishing house is a gentleman by the name of J.D. Walt. And, and J.D. Walt, he does a study every morning called the Wake Up Text. And I think I shared with you a few weeks ago that opening prayer of consecration, I, I, I kind of stole that from the wake up text because I think it's an important thing for us as we start our week together. You know, I, I do it every day as I listen to the seedbed daily text. I consecrate myself and I want us to consecrate ourselves before the message. But, but he is very much into this whole sowing analogy of the church. And he said that we are not sowing just to become a bigger church. We are sowing for a great awakening, for a way for God to open our hearts and our minds to see how God is actively alive and working in each and every person's lives. And we see God when we look at others. He came up with a sower's creed, and I wanted to close our time together sharing in this creed together. And I, I've printed it, and it'll, it'll be on our Facebook group later if you want a copy of it. If you want a copy of it, I can show you where I found it and where you can get it. But it helps me remember of the three things that we've talked about the past three weeks. Number one, we are continued called to go out and sow in the world around us. Second, we are called to sow with one another and to pray for one another and be active with one another in all of the different lives and ministries that we may have. And then finally, we are called to engage. Our faith is not a dead faith where we just sit and listen and say, okay, I'm done. Our faith is called to make a difference in the world around us because God has made a difference in me. So as we close our time together, would you please join me in this Sower's Creed that will be on the screen. Today I sow for a great awakening. Today I stake everything on the promise of the Word of God. I depend entirely on the power of the Holy Spirit. I have the same mind in me that was in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus is good news and Jesus is in me, I am good news. Today I will sow the extravagance of the gospel everywhere I go and to everyone I meet. Today I will love others as Jesus has loved me. Today, I will remember that the tiniest seeds become the tallest trees, that the seeds sown today become the shade of tomorrow, that the faith of right now becomes the future of the everlasting kingdom. Today, I sow for a great awakening. Let us pray. Dear God, today, we sow. Tomorrow we sow, the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. We are called to sow. We have the best, most life-giving 
message that this broken world needs right now. We're not called to argue. We're not called to, to make things our way. But God, we are called to sow and to sow extravagantly. So I pray that as we move into this new future, as we move into this opportunity to be your hands and feet to a hurt and broken world, God, that you remind us that you call us to sow. You call us to sow together. You call us to sow in a way that engages us with our neighbor so that the good news that is in Jesus, which is the good news that is in us because you are in us, is shared with the world around us. So God, help us to sow so that the soil around us becomes enriched with your grace and your good. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, in the presence of Jesus, in the great power of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.